Hello, I'm Sean. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Officer for Audit Wales' Good Practice Team. A few weeks ago, at the start of the crisis, we, I spoke to Deborah Job from Conway Family Centres, um, who gave us an introduction to the service and also mentioned what they were planning to continue their support in the new reality of the COVID-19 situation. I'm very happy to say that she's agreed to come back and speak to us again nine weeks into the crisis to see what worked, what didn't work and what's happened up to now. Thanks Sean for the um, invitation to come back and speak with you a little bit about what we're doing in Conway Family Support in response to the COVID-19 situation. I think it would be useful to share our experiences and we are looking forward to seeing other authorities and um, contributions to this and, and what you're doing too. So as you know we have five family support teams across Conway and we are based within local communities. Um, the Wales Audit Office has asked us to share what we've done differently since the start of the coronavirus crisis, what we've learned and what's gone wrong. So I'm just going to talk through the different levels of support that we provide as a service and how we've been doing things in a different way since the lockdown. So one thing we've been doing is looking at video conferencing solutions. Uh, we know at the moment that families don't really want anything too formal, but they do want to keep in touch with each other and they want to keep in touch with us as well. So what we've done is we have um, set up a questionnaire with the families that we work with and I've just asked them what type of thing would they want to take part in. It might not be a video conference, they might prefer to be part of a texting or a WhatsApp group uh, where they're not committed to a specific time or where they don't have to see their faces on the screen. Um, and we've also asked families the types of themes that they'd be involved with, whether it's just a general chat, whether they'd want to join in with something with people who are in a similar situation to themselves, whether they're a single parent or parents of children with additional needs. Um, and so based on that questionnaire and the results that come through, we are going to set up a timetable of activities. In the meantime, we are keeping in touch with families through um, WhatsApp video conferencing groups as well in terms of that open access in, um, activities that we do. Some of our families actually, um, we've kind of built resilience, I guess, within the communities that they, we work in, are doing their own thing. They've stayed in, in touch with each other and they've carried on doing their activities, but within their own homes and they've stayed in touch with each other via their own groups so one example of that is the sewing group from Canol van den Orben, which is the family centre in Abagala. They've stayed in touch and they've been sewing bags for, um, for health staff. And they've sewn, I think, over 200 bags so far and have been um, delivering them to the staff in Glan Cloyd Hospital, which is lovely because when we look at the five ways to wellbeing, one of them is to give and for those families, the fact that they're contributing to the NHS and to the important work that's going on is really good for them and their well-being and it's the way that they're coping with the situation at the moment. Um, another thing that we're doing is we're sharing clips, online clips, so things like crafts um, and we know that there's an awful lot out there already on the internet and we don't want to duplicate what's already there but there's something about the importance of a familiar and a friendly face so by having one of our own family workers doing that is really reassuring for um, the families that we engage with. In terms of the more targeted groups of things like the parenting courses that we ran and the workshops and things like that we've had to work things again quite differently um, and we're quite conscious at the moment that people don't necessarily want to join in with a formal parenting course. They're not in a place themselves where they want to be learning. They just want to cope with the situation that they're in right now. Um, so what we've done is our parenting practitioner, Mary Bate, has um, filmed some clips, short five minute clips, which remind people about the principles and the lessons from the parenting courses that we have been running. So for those families who've already been on a parenting course, it's just a really timely reminder of some of the things that they've been learning. 
we've developed as well a, um, a clip on sleep and sleep routines because that's a real struggle I think for some families at the moment especially with children perhaps not getting rid of as much energy as they normally would being at home. We've been really fortunate in North Wales because our public health board has bought into the Solihull approach and that is available for free for families online which is a parenting course um, with very similar messages to the parenting courses that we've been running before. So the offer there is for people to join in with that course online and then to talk it over with a family worker around what they're learning. It's between the, the, the online clips and then the, the offer of being able to chat afterwards, we feel that we've really been able to find good solutions to the gap that's been left in terms of our face-to-face -face targeted groups that we were running before. The other thing that our service provides is information and advice and that continues to be the case. What we have um, to help our family workers is a duty rotor in place because it's actually quite hard working from home, especially if you've got children at home with you and it's quite hard to be available at the end of the phone all of the time. So what we've done is each of the five family support teams has a duty rotor where we make sure that there is a family worker that is at the end of the phone and able to answer the phone if a call comes through and that takes the pressure off the rest of the team for that period that there are they are able to pop out um, or do what they need to do with their children at home um, and they know that there won't be somebody trying to call that can't get through. We've been sharing a lot of online information and activities which families have found really helpful. We were quite aware that it can be quite overwhelming the amount of information that's out there at the moment so we've tried to keep what we share really positive um, and not to overwhelm people with too much so what we've been doing is sharing activities to do with children perhaps one a day and then something that is more around people's well-being and they're always based on the five ways to well-being that public health wales have been promoting the other thing that we've done is we have sent out craft packs to um, the families who are involved with this and again that's just an opportunity to give families something really practical um, that they're able to do with the children at home knowing that it's not always easy to get hold of things when perhaps going shopping is a challenge or um, money being a factor as well so families have really appreciated that so the one-to-one -one support that we provide for families, um, what we've done is we've rated the families that we work with as red, amber or green based on what we feel their needs are at this moment in time. Now that can, that can change, it can go up and down, but it means that we've got a system in place for making sure that we are contacting families at the right frequency. Some families don't need a daily phone call in fact it would be quite annoying for them to hear from us that frequently um, but for other families they really appreciate just that listening ear or that somebody making sure that they know that they're not alone what we've done is we've set up a system where we put the latest information on a spreadsheet um, and that's additional to our normal kind of data sharing systems and the reason why we've done that is to make sure that if we do have a staff member going off sick or that we do need to reply, redeploy a staff member that we have the most important and most recent information to hand. We've also been looking at alternatives to free school meals. Um, as you're probably aware, about a week or so ago, we brought in a different system where um, money was being put directly into people's bank accounts instead of them picking up their, um, their pack lunches from school. Now for the majority of families that is a brilliant solution and it makes perfect sense but for the small minority we felt it was really important for us to have a different solution for them because getting money into the bank account wouldn't necessarily mean that children are accessing the food that they need. Um, there might be issues around debt or overdrafts or substance misuse 
Um, so what we've done is we've identi identified those families and we have arranged for them to have to continue to have packed lunches instead. And our family workers or social workers, if they're open to managed care services, are delivering those packs to the doorstep. And it gives them an opportunity to see those families as well and say hi and make sure that they're okay. The other thing that we're set up and we are launching this week actually is a play spaces scheme. Some of our schools are closed because they're working in clusters in terms of the childcare provision. So at the moment they're not being used for anything and we felt that for some families having access to a play space outside would be really beneficial somewhere where they're able to go get rid of a bit of energy um, and spend a little bit of time with a family worker or a support worker. So we have done a very thorough risk assessment. So it's for one family at a time. Um, we leave 72 hours in between individual use so that we don't have to go down the route of cleaning equipment. Um, and we go along with the family and at a safe social distance, we have a chat, we spend a little bit of time with them. Um, and it just gives families that little bit of extra space really. Um, I think in particular, it will be beneficial for those families that don't have their own garden um, or perhaps have children with hyperactivity or autism. But it's open really to any families who um, a family worker or another worker thinks will benefit from it. The other level of support that we continue to provide is links to local services and referrals. And I think in some ways the situation with the pandemic has strengthened our partnership work. And one of the examples of that is the Vulnerable Learners Panel. It isn't necessarily just children on the Child Protection Register, but there are others as well that would really benefit from that. So we set up a panel with education, with managed care services and ourselves from family support. We bring forward people who we think would really benefit from some additional support in terms of either going into school or other methods of support from education. It means that we are taking a fair and consistent approach to those requests and it's a really good opportunity just to make sure that we are communicating effectively with each other. The other thing that we're part of is the additional learning needs helpline that's been set up during the pandemic and it's for those families who need extra support in terms of their children at home with additional needs and we're part of the group that looks at whether there is something that we need to provide in terms of family support in that situation as well so we're really closing the loops in how we communicate with each other and then access to other support uh, other support and services continues as it always has to be honest but just using alternative methods so our domestic abuse services, our family counselling services, our welfare rights are all still available for us to make referrals to them um, um, but they're just available via the phone or video conferencing instead. We've also really been part of the corporate and the community response to what's been going on with COVID-19 and it's been really great to pull together um, and to show like all the work that we've already done in terms of partnerships and building relationships with partners has paid off really during the COVID-19 situation. So we are part of community wellbeing being services within social care. And one of the big areas of work for those services was supporting the shielded people. So the people who have been asked by their doctor not to leave their house for 12 weeks. So we've identified who those people are and made sure that those people who have already been supported by social care services have been given a phone call proactively to make sure that they're okay, that they're able to access what they need um, and that they know what's available and how to get hold of it. The other thing that Community Wellbeing Services has been involved with is setting up a community support line although it has been our community development services that led on that. Um, but our, one of our teams 
who works with sort of over 50 year olds and weren't able to really do much at all after the lockdown were really key to finding out what was available within each local community in terms of deliveries. They've kept that database up to date for the community support line and that's a really important piece of work that was available very quickly within Conway. The other thing that we've been doing is preparing for the redeployment of staff and that's been very much about contingency planning. We're not saying 100% whether staff will need to be redeployed from family support but they are um, they are prepared if they need to be and that completely depends on the capacity of other services to respond to the needs that come up. So those are some of the things that we've been part of in terms of the community response within Conway more widely. We've also identified that it's really important that we respond to the emotional side of what's going on at the moment. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in, in the physical illness, but this is having real impact on people emotionally as well. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to prepare our workforce for was being able to respond, respond to people who have experienced grief, loss and bereavement. Um, so we arranged for there to be training available for people on that. We don't expect them to be experts and bereavement counsellors, that's not what this is, but it's about them being able to know what, what to say and what the right thing to say is under those circumstances, because we know that we are going to come across people who have experienced that. We're also really conscious that there are different kinds of losses, so you've got your secondary losses as well. So things like loss of freedom, loss of opportunity to do things um, for our year six children that loss of not having their last term possibly in school before they go up to secondary school so there are other things that people are experiences experiencing as well which have had quite a profound effect on them emotionally we have identified a course it's a brilliant evidence-based course called seasons for growth which runs at the moment within schools in Conway. But there is a version that you can run with parents as well. And so we have identified two family workers from each of the five areas to attend training, to be able to run that course for parents. And that's around um, dealing with all kinds of loss, not just bereavement. And it's something that can be really beneficial for people a few months after they've experienced that loss, just to come to terms with it and to, to get their heads around moving forward with their lives. The other thing that we organised for all of our teams was a group consultation session from our colleague within Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services and that was just such a worthwhile thing to do. It was really helpful, not only for the staff um, themselves, but for knowing how to respond to families who are struggling emotionally as well. And one of the things that they shared with us was this diagram, three stages of pandemic response. And it was uh, around seeing the parallels between how we respond generally to grief and to change and how that applies in a pandemic situation. So you start off in survival and I think that's probably where I was at the last time we spoke to be honest just getting through each day and feeling it was quite intense and how we can look at moving people from that survival mode into acceptance um, and where they feel more in control of what's going on um, and then possibly into growth although I think we need to be realistic that not everybody's gonna <laughs> reach that stage within the pandemic but it was a really useful tool for us and um, it possibly could be useful for other people as well. So some of the challenges that we've faced. Um, one thing that being part of a local authority is that we have really important and strict digital security protocols and we need to make sure that we adhere to them. And so it's been quite challenging setting up things like video conferencing. What we have available to at the moment to us at the moment is quite business focused and quite corporate and is not necessarily accessible for families and in particular vulnerable families 
And so we are looking at alternatives and we are making sure that what we use works with our dig digital security. And that's something that we need to have in place very soon to be able to set up those online groups that, that we want to be able to set up. The other thing that we found quite difficult is just a lack of face to face contact that we have at the moment with families and just it's just hard isn't it being able to talk over the phone um, and not knowing really how to interpret those silences not being able to read body language and um, that's not just in terms of families that we're working with but with each other as well and being able to communicate with teams and make sure that we're all on the same page and so that's been quite a challenge really um, the other thing I suppose that we found challenging and has been a concern for us is around safeguarding and the fact that we don't have eyes and ears necessarily on people. Um, but we've found ways around that in terms of things like delivering craft packs or delivering um, food packs and things like that. Um, but what we've been really keen to do is to make sure that the safeguarding messages are positive message that it's not a scaremongering message it's more of a look out for yourselves and look out for each other kind of message so there's a picture here of a little video that we shared and it was based on the five ways to well-being but it was really a safeguarding message and at the end it it um, ends with the phone numbers to of who to call if you've got concerns for somebody and the other thing, I guess, again, is just working from home and our workforce, a lot of them do have people that they care for at home. And it's not always easy to give 100% as you normally would. And we've been really careful to make sure that our workforce know that we have realistic expectations of them, that their well-being is really important to us as well. So we have... Um, We've tried to overcome that by just making sure that there are things in place to support them too. But it's it's an ongoing challenge. And I think going forward, what is going to be even more challenging is just planning for the next stage. Because we're going to need to at some point do more face-to-face -face work with people, perhaps after lockdown, but before COVID-19 is over and I think that's going to be a real challenge is just looking at what is appropriate, what's realistic um, and what's safe but making sure that we do respond to the needs of the families that we work with and I think that's it from me. I don't know if you've got any questions. I was just wondering, um, on the new way that you have to work, have you come across anything which you'd like to keep in future when things return to whatever normal looks like. I think there are a couple of things there, to be honest. We have been forced to work in a really different way. And um, in some ways, that's been quite a catalyst, I suppose, um, for some things to happen, which we've wanted to do for a while. So one example is with our parenting clips online, we're really conscious that for some families, they don't want to go on a course straight away. They find the idea of it perhaps a little bit intimidating or there's some stigma attached to it. Whereas with the parenting clips that we have online and the offer of being able to talk through those, it just provides an alternative for families. Um, in particular, I suppose, for those parents who would always find a group situation difficult for whatever reason. Um, and for those families that perhaps might build up to attending a group once they've seen the clips and had to chat with somebody and can see that it, it's perhaps not as bad as they thought it might be. Um, so that's one thing I think that's been really um, an opportunity for us to put in place because we've had to do something in light of the current situation. And the other thing is the um, the communication with our partner services and in particular with education we've always had really good relationships with education services but um, we haven't had as frequent contact I suppose um, we've got brilliant relationships with the local schools within the five areas but this has provided an opportunity to, to build on relationships with our education service colleagues 
at a local authority level. So that's been quite positive as well. And I think we want to continue that frequent contact um, when this is all over, going back to the new normal, <laughs> whatever the phrase is. 